Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Chris Pam United Church to the service of worship on this, the first Sunday in Lent. It is good to be here in the warmth of this place for those of us gathered in the sanctuary. It is also good to be with those who are worshiping with us online. So wherever you are, wherever you may be, please know that you are welcome here, that this is a time in which we pray that God's gifts of hope and peace and joy and love will come upon you and bless you this day. Whenever we gather as a community of faith, we gather around the light of Christ, which reminds us that for us, Jesus is the light of the world, is the one who reveals the way we are to live, is the one who provides light and hope for us in times of darkness and need. So this morning we focus on the light and we give God thanks for this gift. Good morning and welcome to Chris Pam Sish United Church. As part of our welcome, we light this candle lit from the flame of Christ's own light and love as we proclaim ourselves as a community where all people are invited without barriers based on age, gender, race, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, differing abilities, ethnic background, or economic circumstance. We, we celebrate the richness that diversity brings to our church, even as it challenges us to walk down roads we have not yet traveled. We pray for God's spirit to guide us as we work for reconciliation and justice for all persons in both church and society. And as we gather to worship, let us pause to remember that in this region we live and work and worship on lands that are by law, the unceded territories of the Wabanaki peoples, predominantly the lands of the Mi'kmaq, Wallastockwe, Hasmaquoddy, and Penobscot. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. <clears throat> Thank you, Diane. Celebrations. We have some celebrations. First of all, a special and heartfelt thanks to all of those who worked so hard to organize and help with the Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner. I think we served over 90? Yeah, we had 91 plates. 91 plates, and I think it's fair to say that a really good spirit abounded. So thank you to you and to all of <laughs> Other celebrations. We celebrate the fact that Ray and Bill have installed a new railing along the ramp from the foyer up to this level. And I know that took some doing, so thank you to the two of you for this gift. <laughs> I happened to be around here on Thursday evening, and lo and behold, what did I see with two little elves who were standing by the sign by the road and changing it for us. This is something that happens um, from time to time here. And it is done by Hallie and by Carolyn, so thank you for that. <clears throat> this morning, I'm also delighted to welcome my colleague, Reverend Kate Jones, who is with us. Kate is on sabbatical, and uh, Kate, it is absolutely lovely to have you here this morning. So special welcome to uh, you. The problem with being clergy in this area, when you go to different churches, it's almost impossible to stay anonymous, so uh, I hope that's okay. <laughs> Other celebrations, announcements, pieces of good news. In that case, let's join in the singing of our choral intro. <clears throat>
Please join me in our call to worship. Lent is a time of repentance and reconciliation, of contemplation and renewal. Lent is, Lent is a time, a time to, to face those habits and practices that hem us in, in and hold us back. back. Lent is a time to acknowledge some of the temptations that confront us. On this, On this first, first Sunday of Lent, Lent we gather to claim God's liberating love for us and the world. Let us worship God. Let us pray together. Faithful God, from the rush and distractions of our ordinary days, we seek the anchor of your grace and care. In a world filled with temptations, hold us in your steadfast love. Grant us courage so that today's pressures do not overwhelm us. Reshape us in these days of Lent and mold us anew in your image. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 108. For Lent, we, this year, we're going to do something a little bit different. In lieu of a formal prayer of confession, for the next five weeks, we're going to take a couple of moments for some silent contemplation to meditate on a particular word. And the word for today is temptation and at the door at the two doors everyone was to receive a little stone is there anybody who needs a stone who didn't pick one up no i thought that might be the case so some of them are big and some of them are Small. You have one. Oh, there you go. Keener you are. You okay? You're okay. There we go. Hi. So. You and Nana are okay. That would be true. You and Nana are definitely okay.
go. And you need one too. Two, one, two. You'd like one. You go. That's a special one for you. And mommy needs one too, yes. Go. I dropped one. Yes. So did I. <laughs> so, temptations. They abound. And we focus on temptation this morning because the season of Lent is based on the 40 days when Jesus is said to have spent time in the wilderness, time in the desert, right after his baptism. And we have slightly different accounts from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel of what happened there, but we know that it was a challenging time. We know that he was tempted. And so part of what we do in the season of Lent is we remember not only Jesus' temptations, but we also remember some of the temptations that we too may face. Some of them may be big ones. Some of them may be small. Some may be reoccurring some just once in a while. But I would invite us to take a couple of moments in silence to reflect on some of the temptations that you face, that we face. You won't be asked to share anything, so no worries. But it's a time to, to ponder some of what it is that we may struggle with. And it's a time to ask God to invoke the spirit, to come and offer us strength and courage for the living of these days. We know that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth in all creation will be able to separate us from the great, the abiding, the amazing, and the ever-present love of God. Amen. Would any of the Children here this morning like to come up to the front for a minute? One says no. One says, oh yeah, come on up. <clears throat> Hi. Yeah. Your, yeah. Your stone is in there. Well, that's a good place for it. Now, I just used... <clears throat> A really, really big word was temptation. 
Do you know what temptation means? I kind of didn't think so. Should have done this the other way around, probably. Temptation is something that we sometimes want to do, even though we know we shouldn't. So do you ever, is there ever something that you think you would really, really like to do, but you know that you probably shouldn't do that? No. What a good, what a good, what a good guy, what a good guy you are. Well, do you ever want to have ice cream or something in the middle of the day before your supper? Yeah? Is that something that we should do on a regular basis? Uh uh. But we still want to do it, right? Yeah. That's a temptation. And so part of what we do is we try to admit. We try to recognize some of the things that we get tempted by, like wanting to have ice cream in the middle of the day when we probably shouldn't before we have our supper. And it's important to be able to identify these things so that we can do something about them. So I hope that you will know that even though we get tempted sometimes, and all of us here, all of us here get tempted, all of us here want to do some things that we know that probably aren't that good for us. We know that this is natural. And we know that with the help of our family and our teachers and people in the church, that we can live the way that we're supposed to live. <clears throat> now, I'd like to teach you a prayer. Is that okay? So I'm going to say a line. And I'm going to ask you to repeat it. And we're going to ask everybody here in the church to join in so you're not alone, okay? You up to doing that? Let us pray. God be in my head and in my learning. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my hands. And in my doing, God be in my heart, and in my loving, amen. Thank you for coming up here, and everyone who wants to can go off to Sunday school. Our reading today is from Mark 1, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Holy One, may the words spoken, heard, and pondered this day be acceptable in your sight, be in accordance with your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of my favorite preachers is the Reverend Will Williman, and he tells a story of a Bible study class that he was leading one day in a church that he then served. The text under discussion was the one from Mark's Gospel we just read. And so at one point, Williman asked a version of the question that I asked a few minutes ago. Have any of you ever faced temptation, but then with Jesus' help resisted it? Well, the group was silent for a couple of minutes, but then a retired school teacher replied, well, last week at the grocery store, there was some confusion in the checkout line because they were training a new employee. And the next thing I knew, I was out in the parking lot with a loaf of bread that I hadn't paid for. At first, I thought I should keep it because it wasn't my mistake and I figured the store had plenty of money and it was going to be a hassle to have to go back and go through that rigmarole. But then I stopped and I thought, no, that wouldn't be right. So I went back and paid for that loaf of bread and felt really good about that afterwards. Well, Willeman and the others in the class nodded their heads in agreement and similar kinds of stories then followed. But then Verlene cleared her throat. Verlene was a newcomer to this group. She'd been invited by a neighbor to come to church one Sunday morning and she liked the church so much that she decided she'd also check out the Bible study group. So here she was. Well, a few years ago, before I moved here, I was pretty heavy into cocaine, she began. Well, you know how that screws with your head, don't you? So one night, my then boyfriend, not the father of my second child, but the father of my first, he and I go out and knock over a gas station. We get over $200, she says, and it was like taking candy from a baby. But then my boyfriend says to me, hey, let's go knock over that 7-Eleven on the corner. And someone, in, something in me says, no. No, I'm not going to do that. I held up that gas station with you, but I ain't going to hold up no convenience store. Well, he kind of beat the snot out of me after I said that. But I continued to say no. I felt real good about resisting that temptation. And I have to tell you, I really felt like someone after I did that. Verlene then stopped speaking and you can imagine, I suspect, the reaction. Dead silence. What does one say after hearing a story like that? Finally, someone said, well, thank you, Verlene. That's a very powerful story, but I have to tell you, I never thought of resisting temptation in quite that way before. These stories remind us that all of us face temptation sometimes and all of us are required to make decisions, make choices. Of course, some like Verlene deal with temptations that some of us, many of us probably have never had to face. 
but decisions about a variety of important matters sometimes do need to be made. For example, do we heed those voices that call down people who aren't white or Christian or straight and that say that people of my gender with my skin color are superior? A lot of those voices are around us these days. And a lot of those voices say that these attitudes are okay. So we need to make some decisions. We also need to make decisions about whether we heed the advertisers' suggestions that we're not good enough as we are, that we need to color our hair if we have any, that we need to lose weight or get in shape or invest more wisely and do all sorts of other things so that we will move closer to being perfect and measure up. We hear those voices all around us. So we need to make decisions. Then there's other matters too. Is it time for us to think about downsizing, moving into a smaller place, and perhaps finding new living accommodations that offer more services and amenities? Do we try to repair a relationship with someone with whom we've had a falling out? Or do we simply move on? Or do we decide that it is time for us to try and tackle a problem that we know that exists, but a problem, an issue, that we may find daunting and that may make us fearful? Decisions do face all of us, and some of them are not easy to make. Well, thankfully, we know that even Jesus struggled with certain temptations and that he, too, had to make some basic decisions. As Mark tells us, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and nights, was weak and tired, and was tempted by the tempter. But Mark gives us no other details of what happened out in the wilderness. So we rely on Matthew and Luke's accounts to hear the details of what happened. You can have everything, everything you can possibly want, Jesus was told. If you are the Son of God, just command these stones to become loaves of bread and you will have more food than you could ever possibly imagine and you will never, ever, ever go hungry again. Or throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple so that the angels will save you and so the world will know who you are and the power that you have. Or just bow down in front of me and worship me. And you will be able to rule the world. All of this will be yours to do with as you would wish. All you have to do, three simple things and everything you could possibly want, possibly imagine would be yours. Well, that's what Jesus was offered. Sounds pretty attractive, wouldn't you say? Indeed, what's wrong with any of these things? What's wrong of, with feasting when you're starving? Proving to the world in undeniable ways that God really does exist. And having Jesus rather than Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump control much of the world's agenda. Wouldn't we likely be better off if Jesus had said yes? Well, he didn't. 
And theologian Walter Brueggemann suggests that Jesus made the choice he did because he knew that embracing the other options would cause him to turn away from the light that guided his path, the light that gave him his power, his integrity, and instead embrace the forces of darkness. This text is a meditation on the practice of faithful living in contexts that seek to seduce, Brueggemann says. Meditation on the practice of faithful living in the context that seeks to seduce. And so this text is profoundly pertinent to your life and to mine. All kinds of voices do assert that we can and should have it all, that we somehow deserve it. That anyone who isn't content or rich or successful has somehow failed and needs to shape up. And that it is okay to do whatever is necessary in order for us to fulfill ourselves and reach our goals and attain the kind of life that we think we want. And because this message gets repeated again and again and again and again, it's hard not to be taken in by it. Jesus heard these similar voices himself during those 40 days long ago. But still he said no. And by saying no, Jesus derails the forces that sought to co-opt and seduce him. By resisting the three temptations, by remaining faithful to his God and to his calling, Jesus revealed a better way. Jesus revealed a spirit-filled way. Jesus revealed a way that is filled with love rather than hate, that is filled with compassion rather than judgment. And because of the decisions he made, the angels then came and ministered to him and gave him not what he may have wanted, but what it was he needed. So Jesus reminds us that even through, though the unbridled allure of comfort and recognition and power is ever present and can lead us down some very dangerous paths, different choices can be made. Brueggemann reminds us that Jesus is our guide and our model and our resource for how to resist the temptations how to fend off those voices, how to enact deliberate strategies to be who we are called by God to be. And one doesn't have to have been in Verlene's situation to be in need of that kind of help. Of course, none of this is always easy. Indeed, we know that it can take a long time, often a minimum of 28 straight days before a significant change really takes root and starts to become normal for us. But one way of moving from here to there is to ponder a suggestion made by theologian Kate Bowler, some of whose writings we'll be looking at next month in a three-week online Lenten series I'm going to be leading. Perfectionism is impossible, she says, but transformation isn't. Perfectionism is impossible, but transformation is not. And in framing the matter this way, Bowler rejects the perfectionist paradigm that has become so dominant 
and the theological underpinnings that support it. And she replaces it with the notion of a good enough faith. A good enough faith involves recognizing that we are not perfect. We are human. We make mistakes. We face temptation. Sometimes we do that successfully. Sometimes we don't. But this is who we are. And it means that accepting that not only will we make mistakes, we will experience both hurts and disappointments, and so we'll need the gifts of grace and forgiveness to go on. And she also tells us that we are dependent on one another for our health and our well-being and our survival. And that all of the messages that say that you have to do it on your own, and it's up to everybody to lift themselves up by their own bootstraps, simply is not consistent with the way that we have been designed to live. Rather, we are blessed regardless of how our lives appear on social media or the impression we give to former classmates at our high school reunions. We're invited to take small steps and not reach for the utterly impossible. And to use slightly different language, we're invited to see ourselves as being works in progress, who are invited to do our best and to remember that we're not alone on the journey as we strive to do that. All of this involves effort and can mean accepting change and risking change and growth. But it's premised on the belief that new forms of life and hope and love can and do arise in those places and spaces where Jesus' template for life becomes ours, when certain temptations are resisted, and when certain moments of transformation occur. So what does this actually look like? Well, it's a bit like what an old Mennonite pastor once said about putting first things first. As the story goes, he took out a wide mouth mason jar, began filling it with sand. Then he added some smaller stones than the bigger ones, and soon he ended up with what you see on the screen. The jar was overflowing, things wouldn't fit. The big stones, the important stones in some ways, found no room in that jar. But then he said, notice now what happens when you do it differently. And the old preacher then put most of the large stones in first. They anchored the bottom. The medium stones then filled in some of the larger cracks. And finally, sand filled in the rest. Presto. All the stones fit snugly in the jar. There was still lots of room at the top. All because the biggest ones went in first. It can take some time and some discernment to decide what the big stones and the small stones of our lives should be. To distinguish the key priorities that matter most from the ones that just fill in the cracks. But doing so is important, Bowler concludes, because it allows us to build our lives on them. And that is true not only for us as individuals, but it is also true for us as a congregation. 
is true for this church. Indeed, you will still soon be asked to examine the blueprint for the next phase of ministry here that your faith profile committee has been working on. And you'll be asked to make some decisions about what the big stones of your faith and your vision are to be. Making choices isn't always easy because temptations do abound. But times like this can also be exciting, filled with new energy, new hope, and new life. And I believe that remembering the decisions that Jesus made in the desert, recalling the priorities he chose will help you and us make choices that are faithful, sure, and strong. May it be so. Amen. Our hymn is number 115. <coughs> Life and work of this congregation and the wider church continues. And we give thanks for all of that. A reminder that the month of, that during the Lenten season, there'll be several opportunities for some adult study and reflection. 
I'll be leading a five-week series on introduction to world religions here in the church on Tuesday mornings. We'll be doing a three-week online study session of one of Kate Bowler's interesting books that you're all invited to attend. And on Wednesday, there will be a, the second of our broad view discussion sessions. Catherine. I just want to remind everyone this Wednesday, 10 o'clock, we will have our second Broadview banter discussion group. And you get into the group by the same way that you would get online worshiping. So it's the same link and we'll meet at 10 online. And I think perhaps we'll be done around 11-ish, depending how chatty we all are. By chance, I chose all of these articles last December and this this week's will be one that Kate Bauer wrote, and it's on blessings. So if you could give some pondering to the blessings you've had in your life, the blessings you'd like to have in your life, we'll have a great time this Wednesday at 10. And thanks to Leslie Reed, she linked this article with the PDF file, and it's in the announcements. So if you don't get a paper copy of the article, you can pick one through the online uh, announcement page. Thank you. Thanks. Carolyn? <clears throat> Hi, I want to play a short little game, but uh, council people, I'm sorry, you can't play. <coughs> um, Sandy and I took the uh, blessing bags into uh, Avenue B last Tuesday. Would anyone like to guess how many bags we took in? Oh, come on, somebody must have a number. 52. 50. Oh, who said 50? That's exactly what we took in. 50 bags. So, so on behalf of uh, Outreach, I just want to thank the uh, congregation again for the terrific uh, response to the Blessing Bag uh, initiative. And once again, you guys never cease to amaze me. Thank you. I know we briefly talked about the pancake supper, but I just wanted to thank everybody who contributed from the set up, clean up, put up, take down, dishwashers, those who helped with the decor. We had um, little centerpieces that we got to add to the, to the day. We had um, Shrove Tuesday, trivia placemats. Um, and it, uh, it's it's amazing how people just get together people just work and things get done <laughs> amazingly your your efforts didn't go unnoticed or unappreciated but it's hard to name everybody to thank people for what they did we even in the days of rising grocery costs we managed to make 588 dollars profit after expenses and i just want to say thank you for everybody who came and supported us and most of all to people who showed up and ate pancakes with us because without you this couldn't have happened thanks so much any other announcements pieces of news the life and work of the church here and abroad relies on the generosity of all of us, the generous givings of gifts of time and talent and energy and money. We are grateful for these gifts. We give thanks for the hearts that have given them and we give thanks for the way that they have been given. With thanksgiving, let us join in the singing of our dedication hymn. Let us pray. 
O God, the source of all good things, we bring to you our gifts, our earthly things, the love of our hearts, and the service of our lives. All this we give through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. One of the temptations that we can face is to forget sometimes the experience of others in the church whose lives and whose reality have been quite different. And so as part of our recognition of Black History Month, I'm going to show just a short video from the United Church on Nancy Oliver McKenzie, the work of Union United Church in Montreal, and how this congregation has provided sanctuary and inspiration and strength to members of the black community in that city. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. When you know your history and you preserve your history and you celebrate your history, then you will have a very good chance of not repeating some of the mistakes of history. My name is Nancy Oliver McKenzie, originally from Nova Scotia, came to the Union United Church of Montreal for about the past 30 years. And I got quite involved in the history here. In 1902, there was a group created called the Colored Women's Club of Montreal. And they were the wives of porters and they began a group to assist newcomers, black newcomers to Canada, to Montreal. Black people of, of Montreal were not particularly comfortable in going into the churches that were already established here. So they met and decided to create their own church. And it was created in 1907, and it was called Union Congregational Church, and uh, which eventually became Union United Church in 1925. It's been a leader in many ways um, in terms of sanctuary, in of refugees in terms of the boycotting of uh, South African products when Mandela was in jail. And that resulted in Mandela coming to Montreal to Union United Church in 1990, actually. And he spoke from the pulpit of Union United Church, which is one of our, our, our proudest moments in the church. The diversity is what makes it stronger. And I think it's what holds union together. Let us pray. As we enter into this holy season of Lent, O oh God, we give you thanks for your promise of new life that sustains us, encouraging us when news is difficult, 
offering strength and hope when we are weak, providing direction and wisdom to help us make faithful and spirit-filled decisions. We thank you, O oh God, for the diversity of your church, for the ways in which persons of different colors and ages, and genders and orientations are able to be welcomed, be declared worthy, and given full opportunities to live, love, and serve. May the spirit of inclusive love May your spirit of inclusive love pervade our churches and reach beyond these walls. This morning we give thanks for even the tiniest signs of hope that appear in a world that seems so fraught, so troubled, so bruised. We give you thanks for glimpses of beauty and a smile or a ray of sunshine, for the people who support others in times of difficulty. Thank you for the chance to recover from mistakes and to begin again. We remember, O oh God, those who are in special need of grace and care and love this day. We remember those who have been excluded because of race or class or creed or age or gender or orientation or ability and who carry the scars of that exclusion. We remember those who have been hurt by harsh words or careless deeds. We remember those who are carrying heavy, heavy burdens that sometimes feel too heavy to care. We remember those who are seeking employment or who are worrying about their jobs or their businesses. We pray for troubled places in our world, for those who work for reconciliation and understanding. We pray for peace, for peace in Middle East and Palestine and Gaza, for peace in Ukraine, for peace in other war-torn parts of this planet. We pray too, O oh God, for churches seeking new ways to minister in changing times who are finding and searching for new opportunities for service and faithfulness in new ways of being. Watch over this congregation as it enters into a time of decision making and discernment. And finally, O oh God, we pray for those who are close to us, who are in special need of your care and your grace. We pray for the Smith family, for Kristen, for Peg and Jacques and Pam, we pray for Ken, Bonnie, Doris, Gloria and family. We pray for Nancy and Rose, for Pat and Andrea, for Mac and family, for granddaughter Jean, for Sandra and Peggy, Ford. We pray for Barb McBean. We pray for all of those in war-torn countries for Kim and Wayne, Tina, Linda, Ada, Stephen, Henry, 
Ricky, Heather, Stephen, Peyton, and family. And we pray for those, O oh God, whose names we lift before you now in silence. We offer these and all of our prayers in the name of the one who taught us to pray in the following way. Our closing hymn is number 633, Bless Now, O God, the Journey. As we begin our journey through the season of Lent, let us remember the word prophet. What does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. And now as we prepare to depart from this place, may the grace of God attend you. May the love of God surround you. 
And may the Holy Spirit go with you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>